and I'm the Prevention Programs Associate for the Colon Cancer Alliance. And on behalf of the Never Too Young Coalition and the Colon Cancer Alliance, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, My Story, Colon Cancer Before 50. This is the first segment in our four-part series on young onset colorectal cancer and will focus on the experiences of young onset CRC survivors before they were diagnosed with colon cancer. Before we go too far into the webinar, I'd want to take a moment to let you all know that this time tomorrow, all of you will be receiving an email survey about this webinar the Never Too Young Coalition and the Colon Cancer Alliance value your opinion and would like to hear your honest feedback on how we can make delivery of our webinars better. Please, please look for that email and take our survey. Help us help you. This afternoon's webinar will be providing background on colon cancer, specifically on the rising incidence rates of this disease for those under age 50 and the importance of knowing your family history. Then each of the four survivors will share their unique experiences on how they arrived with their cancer diagnosis. Before I introduce our speaker, a quick note here about questions. We envision this webinar to be interactive where inter attendees can pose questions for the presenters. After our speakers have finished presenting, we may be able to address a few of the questions presented by attendees during the webinar. Because of the number of attendees and because we are tracking the questions, we're only accepting questions posted online during the webinar using the webinar control panel. To submit a question for consideration and possible use, click on the small plus sign located next to the word questions on the webinar control panel located on the right side of your screens. Then type your question in and hit enter. All questions will be asked on a time available basis, so please accept my apologies in advance if your particular question does not get asked. However, all questions that we are unable to get to will be collected and followed up on after the webinar. And with that, we will introduce our speakers. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Christopher Liu from the University of Colorado, Denver. Dr. Liu is a member of the Developmental Therapeutics and Gastrointestinal Medical Oncology Program. These comprehensive programs include multidisciplinary cancer clinics, tumor boards, and research endeavors. Dr. Liu is interested in resistance mechanisms to targeted therapy in GI cancers, and he was awarded the Conquer Cancer Foundation Career Development Award to study targeted therapies in colorectal cancer. Dr. Liu, welcome, and I'm turning it over to you. Thank you so much, Lauren, and thank you everybody for joining uh, this webinar. Uh, this is an issue that's near and dear uh, to my heart, and I'm sure everybody else's heart uh, on this call. Uh, it, this is certainly something that uh, came uh, up even in my training at MD Anderson when I was told that the original or the average age of diagnosis for colorectal cancer in the United States was 69 years old. And uh, I couldn't figure out why I was seeing so many patients that were under the age of 50. Uh, and this led to an area of research that uh, I was involved with at MD Anderson and of course uh, am involved with now at the University of Colorado Cancer Center. Um, I do want to go over uh, some brief statistics and an update on where we are for the treatment of colorectal cancer, uh, particularly metastatic colorectal cancer. And then I want to talk a little bit about um, the differences between older patients with colorectal cancer and younger patients uh, with colorectal cancer. And of course, after that, I'm going to hand it off uh, to our other panelists uh, who are going to tell some pretty amazing stories. So just to give you uh, some brief background on colon cancer, we know that colon cancer is the second leading cause of cancer-related death in the United States. But colon cancer is much more prevalent than I think people understand in the general public. Uh, on average, your risk is about 1 in 20 of developing colorectal cancer over the course of your lifetime, although this varies widely according to individual risk factors, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. 
Um, a majority of the patients that develop colorectal cancer are over the age of 50, um, but rates in the younger population are increasing dramatically, and um, I'm going to show you some statistics on that, uh, and that's obviously the reason why we're having this call. People with a first-degree relative uh, who have colon cancer have, has a two to three times uh, increased risk of developing disease, and the last part of this slide is the most important statistic uh, that I have, and there are more than a million survivors in the United States with colorectal cancer, and this number continues to increase, and that is actually uh, an amazing number and a very promising number. I want to talk briefly about what colorectal cancer was like just 15 or 16 or 17 years ago in 1997 uh, versus today. Uh, and if you were diagnosed with colorectal cancer in 1997, there was one FDA-approved therapy to treat this cancer. And it was a drug that was originally developed in 1957, and for four decades there was no other FDA-approved drug that improved survival for patients with colorectal cancer. About one out of every 10 patients that would receive this particular drug would respond to it, and the overall survival was quite dismal. And I want to contrast that from 1997 today to today, where we have over nine FDA-approved therapies to treat colorectal cancer, which has improved the response rate. Are, the, are patients going to get a great response to, this, to these drugs uh, to over half? Uh, so we've increased that uh, essentially over six times uh, what was currently available in 1997. And most importantly, overall survival has tripled in our recent trials. And every single time that we look at overall survival in our uh, research trials, they continue to improve, suggesting that we are getting better. There probably will be another FDA-approved therapy uh, coming this fall uh, for the treatment of metastatic colorectal cancer. And while this is certainly a dramatic improvement over the last 15 years, we certainly need to do better, and our patients certainly deserve better uh, from our treatment. We also know that colorectal cancer is very expensive. Uh, and so in 1997, six months of this one drug, 5-fluorouracil, that had been around for four decades, basically cost about $500. So still quite expensive, but at least somewhat affordable. And contrast that to now, where over 30 months of therapy with the combinations of drugs that we can offer today cost greater than 400000 So while we have improved survival, for our patients with colorectal cancer, it certainly has come at a cost, uh, not only in terms of side effects and toxicity, uh, but also monetarily as well. And so this is what our objective is, and this is the research that's being done literally across the world, and that is that um, we don't want to just be able to offer drugs. We want to be able to find the right drugs for the right patient. And you're going to see more and more research coming out really trying to personalize therapy for our patients with colorectal cancer, to actually not give treatment when our patients aren't going to benefit from it or they don't need it, and to offer better personalized therapies for our patients with colorectal cancer so that we know that the drugs that we're going to give are actually going to uh, help our patients, make them feel better, and live much, much longer. And you're going to see more and more of that research coming out over the next couple of years. So that's a general overview of where we are for colorectal cancer. Um, I want to kind of shift our focus to um, what our topic is today, and that is young patients with colorectal cancer. So I already told you that the average age of diagnosis for colorectal cancer is 69. Patients younger than 50 years of age basically uh, com com comprise about 5% of the total incidence of colorectal cancer, but this is the um, kind of shocking fact, and this is something that uh, we really do need to research more, and that is that this number is expected to double uh, in the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, and so whereas cancer uh, rates and death rates are actually decreasing across most cancers in the United States, this is a segment of our population where cancer is actually increasing, and we need to know why. Only 5 to 7 percent of young patients that develop colorectal cancer uh, are actually attributable to known hereditary factors. So a lot of the cancer that's being, uh, that's being found in younger patients is literally coming uh, seemingly out of nowhere. And the old school belief is that all patients are the same, whether you're 25 years old or 70 years old, um, that young patients with colorectal cancer are exactly the same as older patients with colorectal cancer. Um, there are some of us in the academic community who have never believed this to be true, and we're seeing more and more evidence come out that young patients with colorectal cancer are definitely different than older patients, and this makes it 
uh, possible that we could actually try and find targeted therapies that may work better in younger patients than other uh, older patients. A lot of my patients ask me, what are the things that I'm supposed to be looking for? Um, uh, what are some of the signs and symptoms that are concerning? And I, and I did want to describe a little bit uh, about what patients might find if they are diagnosed with colorectal cancer. And you're going to hear a lot more about this from our panelists. But you're basically looking for any change in your bowel habits, including diarrhea or constipation. Obviously, any rectal bleeding or blood in your stool is cause for concern uh, and something that you would definitely want to discuss with your doctor. Any persistent abdominal discomfort uh, or a feeling that your bowel doesn't completely empty uh, is, uh, can sometimes be a concerning sign. Weakness and fatigue is something that a lot of us experience on a general, uh, on a daily basis. Um, so it's not a particularly specific finding, but can be a sign of cancer, as can unexplained weight loss. One of the things that you might notice on every single one of these bullet points is that these are all pretty vague and fairly common symptoms. Uh, and so a lot of patients or a lot of people will have a, a combination of a lot of these symptoms, but obviously not all of them have cancer. Um, one of the purposes of this webinar is to increase awareness. We want not only patients, but also doctors to be aware that this should be on the differential diagnosis list. We also know that quality of life questionnaires uh, between older and younger colorectal cancer survivors are somewhat similar, but we also know that there's certain differences as well. So worse in younger patients, fatigue, shortness of breath, insomnia, post-traumatic stress and financial difficulties, these are all things that we know are worse in younger patients. And some of these things are uh, kind of unique to younger patients. When you're young and you get diagnosed with this, with this disease, um, you're in a period of your life where you're building your career. Uh, and so finances are certainly different when you're talking about a 30-year-old versus, say, an 80-year-old. And of course, post-traumatic stress is something that I really want to kind of uh, bring home as a take-home point. Uh, my patients that I treat, my young patients with colorectal cancer, have really been through a war. And even when they're done with their treatments and they're kind of back to living their lives, um, you still have a lot of post-traumatic stress, understandably, from, the, from everything that's happened at such an early age. And then the last thing is that oncofertility is something that's very rarely addressed, but a lot of our patients that are young and have colorectal cancer um, may be thinking about children or more children and certainly something that I want everybody to be aware of because this is a discussion that you should have with your physician. So it's a, that's a basic brief overview of where we're at. I'm going to actually turn this over uh, very shortly over to Lauren to introduce our next speakers. But in terms of take-home points, if I wanted to stress three main things, is that all young patients who have a diagnosis of colorectal cancer should have an access to a multidisciplinary team dedicated to addressing issues unique to this age group. You want multiple doctors, multiple specialists, um, social workers, um, counselors, all working together as your team uh, to take care of you. Um, it's always important to know what your family history and your risk of developing colorectal cancer is. And as I'm sure uh, our panelists are going to tell you, there is no such thing as too young. Every single one of my patients have, was told at some point, oh, you're too young to have colorectal cancer. Uh, and then uh, eventually a diagnosis was made, typically delayed. Um, and so I'm going to hand it back over uh, to Lauren to introduce our speakers, and I'll be available afterwards to answer questions. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Liu, I appreciate that. Um, we're gonna move on now and introduce uh, Travis Spray. So Travis, take it away. Thank you very much, Lauren, I really appreciate it. And I wanted to thank, <coughs> thank you all for having me uh, on the panel, especially since I, as a previvor, have never actually had colon cancer. Um, I have a, uh, I'm the third generation previvor uh, my grandfather was the first person in my family to have a, was to be diagnosed with a disease called familial adenomatous polyposis, which is a disease that uh, 
causes cancer somewhere in the mid in the mid 30s, and if left diagnosed, it is terminal cancer with the average average age of the, you know around 40. And that was how this disease touched our family first was with my grandfather's passing, and then three of his six children finding out that they also had uh, had the disease, and um, obviously I also have it. But what was key was after having this family history and, and knowing that, that that he had the the FAP, doctors become more uh, proactive in our care, and which I definitely benefited from. Um, the early signs for him were, you know, the early signs of colorectal cancer, the constipation, pain, bleeding, um, except for he was kind of a full of bravado and gusto and just never went to the doctor. Um, but uh, even, you know, for me, uh, these these early signs, thankfully, I, you know, when I was a kid, I had uh, the similar signs. I, I was bleeding a fair bit. But because they knew what to look for, they could start my colonoscopies. And uh, I was clinically diagnosed, although they were pretty sure I had it long before. But I was clinically diagnosed when I was 15 and underwent a prophylactic surgery where my colon and my rectum were removed to prevent me from uh, developing cancer. And it's the same disease, same similar surgeries that my aunt and my dad and my cousin all benefited from. And as a result uh, of this, uh, preventative care, this treatment, and being compliant with the screening and the uh, the care protocols that the doctors gave me, I had two really good decades, well, over two decades of uh, what I call successful previvorship by continuing to be uh, pro uh, proactive with my care. I've uh, with one little hiccup, I had a little rectal tumor where they apparently didn't get all of my rectum when I was young. I had one little benign tumor removed. Managed to. Uh, never have cancer, um, which is very cool. But, uh, you know, after after living with this disease Muted. so long, uh, I've been able to kind of look back and see where things went wrong, maybe with my family or what I could have done better. Um, the, the the biggest take home, especially for uh, young people, is, 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 is the persistence that is often necessary to receive the care that you need. Um, as Dr. Lou said, it's uh, not uncommon, for, or, you know, or, or it's not uncommon for patients to go in with bleeding and for it to be dismissed, perhaps as hemorrhoids, or IBS, or IBD, or some other some other condition that's not cancer, just because they are in their in, in their late teens or early twenties, or uh, maybe in the case of Lynch syndrome in, the, in their uh, late thirties, early forties, or mid forties, and just that persistence and uh, pushing for a uh, a referral. Um, to a center of excellence so that you can be under a care of a team of individuals that can help manage um, the myriad of uh, issues that can arise with these hereditary forms. Um, Dr. Lewis said that uh, the, the, the genetic, genetics account, I think he said 5 to 7 percent of young onset. I had the numbers a little bit higher with the uh, National Cancer Institute saying that 5 to 6 percent of all colorectal cancer cases were from genetics. And uh, it's a large number, 140,000 people or so develop cancer uh, and will, will, will develop cancer in uh, 2015. And of that, nearly 10,000 of them will be from a genetic cause. So uh, I think my little five minutes is up. I don't want to take too long for the rest of the speakers, but I just want to thank you again for having me on the call. Unmuted. And I'll turn this back over to the next speaker. I'm looking forward to hearing from Dave. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Travis. Uh, Dave, we'd love to hear uh, your story next. Can you hear me now? We're, we're here. Good. I was having some computer issues, but muted. We do unmuted. So uh, thanks, Travis, and thanks everyone. Muted. On um, Travis actually covered some of the uh, Lynch syndrome components, which is great. I don't mind uh, following suit afterwards. But um, yeah, so my story is uh, similar to a lot of other Lynch syndrome people, um, where you have early stage diagnosis. So uh, I was 29 years old when I had the what are considered the traditional symptoms of colon cancer, uh, 
I was having a feeling of blockage. Um, I had a feeling of, like cramps and, and I was having in fact uh, blood in the stool, but at 29 years old, I was uh, not losing weight. Uh, I was not lethargic and uh, I have led a full active life. Uh, but at 29, uh, recently married, first son, new house, sold the business, uh, a lot of stress. So I was misdiagnosed uh, by my primary physician as, you know, there's probably something else. It's something uh, hemorrhoid related, stress related, take something over the counter and it'll go away. Now, understanding that family history of colon cancer was right on my chart. So my grandfather had colon cancer um, in his 60s. Uh, my father had colon cancer in his 40s. And even though it was right there, uh, I was still misdiagnosed. So uh, I, I was either, you could call it misdiagnosis, you could call it a, a non-diagnosis. But uh, ultimately, it wasn't treated. And it wasn't until a few months later when I went back because the symptoms had not subsided that I was um, in fact diagnosed with colon cancer. So it was considered stage three. Um, and you know, when you're 29 years old, you, you know, you kind of feel like Superman still you're in your twenties. Um, you know, you're athletic still, you, you're, I guess you're in the prime of your life, so to speak. And, um, you know, all of a sudden you get hit in the face with a frying pan. It says colon cancer and you know, what do you do? So this is 1997 and there was no laparoscopic surgery back then, or at least it was this beginning of it. And, you know, um, you know, real surgery took place and you're cut open like a tuna and you all of a sudden are incredibly vulnerable and you, you've lost uh, a big portion of your life, um, potentially, and, and your way of life has changed and the way you perceive yourself has changed and it's a, a real, transition that um, a lot of people have trouble with, uh, including myself. You, you really, you want different, you want the new family, you want everything to be positive and you know you have a major roadblock in the middle of it and, and it, it's really a difficult thing. Um, from the standpoint of, of uh, I guess what's similar to Travis had to say where you have the hereditary component, I at least had um, positive things to look forward to in that my grandfather lived well into his 80s. My father was still alive. Uh, so from that standpoint, uh, I did have some positive things to look forward to. But uh, yeah, there, there are a lot of issues that go into being a colon cancer survivor uh, in your 20s and 30s. Um, and it took a while to get back on the horse. Um, you know, it took a couple of months before I could start exercising again, playing soccer again. And I'm uh, happy to say that the guys I played ball with had no mercy on me whatsoever. And uh, I think it was the, the best thing uh, in the long run is that uh, nobody treated me any different or, uh, and I didn't want to be treated any different. And I was able to pick up and keep going. And if you want, I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Unmuted. Muted. Unmuted. Great, thank you so much, Dave. Um, Allison, we will turn it over, turn it over to you. Okay, so um, my story is a little bit different than the guys. Um, I had Crohn's at the age of 12, but I have a family history of Crohn's and colitis or GI-related diseases. My grandfather died of ileitis. My mom um, has Crohn's. So, by, at the age of 12, I was until so I'm currently 35 I was on all sorts of different medicines to treat it they can never really get it under control I think I was never I had little patches of remission with the Crohn's disease but I was never fully in remission so blood was normal for me I was muted. So I was tired all the time unless I was taking iron um, but over the years I learned how to live with it and you know, went to college and lived a, a normal life just like everyone else that has any sort of um, uh, inflammatory disease. Um, so I was on Remicade when I was diagnosed. It was, I thought my disease was under remission. I was having scopes because of the Crohn's every year. Uh, I went in for uh, just general scope because I was having um, some weird issues like the guys were talking. I was 
constipated. I was used to going to the bathroom 10 to 12 times a day, and all of a sudden I wasn't going that much. I felt like I had heartburn. The blood was normal, so I didn't think anything with that. It was just the, the constipation. So before I actually went in for my scope, my doctor had me um, do what you would do for a scope just to kind of clean me out, and uh, they did an x-ray, and they looked like there was maybe a stool blockage. No one kind of knew what was going on for the first few weeks until um, I had my scope. Uh, I just went on with my life as usual. I went to uh, a bachelorette party, then I came back and I had rescheduled my scope because I wanted to go to that. So of course I was, I think I was 30, 31 at the time, 31 going on 32. And I just was uh, having fun working out all the time. I was in actually great shape at the time, working out four to five times um, a week at the gym. I didn't notice any unusual drop in my weight. It was mainly the the main thing for me because blood was normal was the, the heartburn, the kind of difference in my bowel not going as much as I used to go. And so I went in for my scope and um, woke up and my mom had told me, the doctor said she found something that looked a little abnormal but she didn't think it was cancer. And then it was a few days later my doctor called me and asked me to come in and she gave me the diagnosis in her office, which was crazy. I wasn't expecting it because she didn't think it was cancer after the scope, but it turned out it was. So I went through uh, chemo and radiation and all that sort of stuff, but now I'm cancer free. Because of the Crohn's, they took my whole colon out because it was diseased from the years and years of all the medicine and whatnot. So. One thing with the Crohn's that's different is that the likelihood of having any sort of laparoscopic surgery if you have colon cancer is, I would assume, slim to none because your, your colon is going to be diseased. Um, so the one thing that, for me, that I tell people that now have reached out to me about um, colon cancer is if you see blood, go to the doctor. If you have Crohn's and you always see blood or you normally see blood, go in for those yearly scopes because between my first my scope a year a little bit over a year earlier there was no cancer everything looked okay so within a year I had a 13 centimeter tumor blocking my colon and that was that was what the blockage was it wasn't stool it was the tumor so I keep on telling people that even though we're young we're not invincible like we all think we are and it can hit you at, at any age and with the Crohn's and all the medicines that I was on, they there's always a side effect that you could have colon cancer, but I never thought to myself that I would get it because my mom has Crohn's and she's had it for a long time and she never got colon cancer. And I don't have, there's no genetics. They did genetics on me and I don't have Lynch syndrome. I don't have any of the genes. So even though the Crohn's runs in our family or GI sort of stuff, uh, cancer, the colon cancer doesn't. I'm the first one in my family to have colon cancer. Now I have other cancers in my family, but but not the, the colon. Um, so I guess with that, um, I just urge anyone unmuted. If you see any sort of symptoms, I mean, I think blood is the tell tell sign that you should go see a doctor. But overall know your body really well and if something doesn't seem right go see the doctor and push 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 to see a specialist if you think there's something wrong with me I knew my body really well so I knew there was something wrong because when you go from going to the bathroom a zillion times a day to not going that much there has to be something wrong and so I luckily caught my my cancer early on and I am now now in remission but that's because they took my whole colon so I can't get colon cancer again. I went through the treatment. I work in a cancer research lab. I work with five of you in my lab, and that's the treatment I got for my, my cancer. So if anything, I should be educated more than the average person, but it still happened to me, and it can happen to anybody. So I caught mine early because I knew my body and knew there was something wrong. That's the most important thing. Don't wait. Because if you wait, it could be stage four, it could be inoperable, it could have spread. Mine stayed in my colon. It almost broke through the colon wall. If I had waited a little bit longer, 
within the year might have broken through the colon wall and spread somewhere and I might not be here today talking to you guys. So, I mean, I can't stress it enough to push and talk to your doctors and if you see anything weird, even if it's not colon cancer, go see your doctor and, and see a specialist because I, young people, we just, we think we're invincible and we're really not. So with that, um, thank you for listening to my story and I'll pass it on to uh, the next person to talk about theirs. Great. Thank you so much, Allison. Um, Don, uh, we give you the floor. Okay. Thank you so much for inviting me to share my story with all of you. Um, it's been a really long journey and um, it's really great and therapeutic actually to, to talk about my story, but to also share um, with anyone else that's dealing with especially stage 4 disease, um, you know, that this is something um, that you can conquer uh, and that it isn't hopeless. Um, I'm really honored to be in this lineup with fantastic individuals, uh, honestly. It's inspirational, and I'm, I'm thankful for Dr. Liu sharing our passion uh, for eradic eradicating this disease. Um, you know, we're hopeful that we're going to find some cures and find answers. So I really hope I can finish strong here with the, my story. So I'll start at the beginning. Um, I was 21, and uh, it was not only a huge year for my social life, because I could finally drink, um, but it also uh, offered up some additional worries for me. Um, I'd had bleeding on and off all year um, when I had bowel movements and because of a new job I had to wait uh, until the fall of 1998 to seek uh, medical attention and see my doctor. I was worried uh, but my doctors didn't suspect anything serious uh, but just to be safe uh, she ordered a, an upper GI and a colonoscopy. So I had the upper GI done uh, but insurance denied the colonoscopy because I was too young. Um, I was a little concerned still, but I figured they were right. Uh, you know, the doctors didn't fight for the tests, so I trusted my doctors that there's nothing to worry about. Um, but over the years, you know, my bleeding would still come and go. It did go away for a while, um, but it came back. And my, but my fears lessened because I would tell every doctor that I met uh, what my symptoms were, and um, so it kind of became my normal. And um, so I just figured that you know, if doctors were really worried and concerned, that they would seek more tests, more testing. Um, but I told at least a dozen doctors at various hospitals and practices about my bleeding in history and none were alarmed. So the years passed and uh, my life went on. I was really active, I ate well, I lived well. Um, you know, my career flourished and I, I found the love of my life. We got married, we had two beautiful children and uh, life was perfect, it was completely perfect. Um, but when I was pregnant with my, my son, my second child, I noticed I was getting uh, worse symptoms, um, a lot more bleeding. I, I could barely go to the bathroom, uh, and when I did, there was a lot of bleeding, mucus, thinning stool. So I called my OB, and uh, she said it was hemorrhoids, not to worry, didn't even need to do an exam. She's seen it 100,000 times, um, very common in pregnancy. Uh, the funny thing is, though, and the ironic thing is, I actually WebMD'd my symptoms and it came back with colon cancer. And I thought, what? <laughs> but my doctor said it was nothing. Uh, and I didn't want to be the hypochondriac patient uh, that fights with the doctor and cites WebMD as their source. Uh, so I kept quiet and uh, went on with her theory until April Fool's Day of 2013, April 1st. And I say it was a day that will live in infamy is, uh, is true. Um, I was reassured as they were wheeling me into the exam room, they were sure it was nothing and I'd be out of the colonoscopy in no time. Even the GI doctor that I met with before said it was going to be routine and you know, not to worry, maybe it was a polyp, um, but we'd catch it in the early stages and, and don't be afraid. Um, but 10 months have passed since my extreme symptoms started when I was preg pregnant with my son and I woke up from that procedure to a diagnosis I, I could barely even believe that they said right there I had cancer. I was devastated. I kept reading the report, <laughs> looking at the pictures that they handed me, and um, I couldn't believe that, number one, I hadn't done something sooner to get this Muted. care of. Um, and, and how could it be? I had no family history. I ate healthy. I felt healthy enough. My son was only six months old. My daughter was two. I was only 36. How does this happen? 
um, young people don't get colon cancer. <laughs> this must be a mistake. <laughs> so three days later, we waited. That was a long wait time, and the pathology confirmed that we were dealing with colorectal cancer. The next month I refer to is the cancer vortex. That's where I, I dubbed that term because um, this is from the time you hear you have cancer to when you start treatment, it's a whirlwind of tests, blood draws, scans, appointments uh, with numerous specialists. And uh, I was told at first I was probably stage one, stage two. The colorectal doctor told me maybe at worst I was stage three, but not to worry. We could still cure it. We could still, we, I was still um, going to survive. And after numerous tests and scans, it was revealed that the cancer had spread to my liver. I was actually stage four. And I started Googling, which is a really bad thing to do. <laughs> I completely lost it for a couple weeks. Um, every time I saw my children, I burst out in tears. When I thought of them growing up without me, it was like someone punching me in the gut every single time. What would, I, what would they do without me? <laughs> what would they do without a mother? Would it scar them for life? Um, you know, I lost my father at 17, so, and I could only think of the way it impacted me negatively, and I couldn't think of anything else but them. You know, would they ever know how much I, they, that I love them? Would they ever, you know, know me? Would they have memories of me? They were so young. So my anger and fear, those first couple of months, uh, drove me to dig in and fight for my family, fight for my life, for my husband and my children. And I really can say I would do anything to survive it, anything, no matter what the suffering. Um, so my doctors had lined up a pretty rigorous um, and aggressive treatment plan. Um, you know, radiation, sometimes they don't use that. Um, in my case, because I was, um, I had an eight centimeter tumor, uh, two centimeters from my anal verge. It was very low, very painful. I was in extreme stress all the time. Um, so we decided to go ahead with radiation uh, with chemo. We did 30 rounds of that. Uh, and then I decided to kind of go off uh, the rails a little bit and um, against the algorithm and did neoadjuvant or uh, chemo before surgery. That was to make sure that the tumor shrank even more. We knew that I was responding to 5-FU so, um, because of the chemo during radiation. So we went ahead and did more chemo. So I did six months of Zelox, which is Zelodec, and um, oxaloplatin. And then I decided to have surgery. I didn't want to have surgery, but I knew it was the best uh, chance for my survival. So I had a lower anterior resection, which basically takes out your rectum and part of my sigmoid colon. And I have a direct connect from my colon to my sphincter, which was not very fun at first. <laughs> um, but then uh, before my ileostomy reversal, which I also had, um, I had them do another PET scan, and it revealed that it uh, another met had popped up in my liver, and I was devastated again because I thought, okay, with current disease, this is not good. Um, so I decided uh, to do more chemo after that. We had a liver resection, um, and I had my uh, ileostomy reversed, and it was pretty rough. <laughs> but with all my downtime uh, during all this treatment and chemo, I decided the best way to treat beat this disease was to learn everything about my opponent. I studied for hours online, looking at all the journals, looking at all the different support groups, um, trying to learn as much as I can. I looked at integrative treatments. I read about the latest innovations and options. Um, it was a great use of my time because I didn't really have much else to do. And uh, I learned a lot. Uh, and it gave me a goal and a purpose. I joined those online support groups and soaked in all the knowledge possible. Um, and I'm, I'm so grateful for the friends I've made um, over the last two years and the support I've found from my fellow warriors. We are truly a family. We're so close. Uh, no one wants to be a part of that family, <laughs> but we take care of each other and we pull each other through the darkest times. Um, you know, so I had to find that will to survive. And besides earning my honorary medical degree and watching my kids grow up, I had to find a way to stay positive and keep fighting. Uh, before I was diagnosed, I could never imagine how anyone could stop treating. Before I had experienced uh, what treatment was really like, what chemo was really like, and what surgery was really like, I always thought of it as giving up. How could anyone do that, give up, choose uh, to leave their families and stop receiving chemo or forego a surgery? But that was before I had cancer and I lived it myself. It's miserable, actually. It's beyond miserable. And, um, you know, uh, like the panelists before me said, 
you know, you really do know when something's wrong. So, you know, make sure you're your best advocate because going through this is much worse, um, you know, than going through a colonoscopy or a diagnostic test. Um, but I had to dig deep and find that little live and um, not only live, but I wanted to live well. I wanted uh, some kind of a normal life after this. I wasn't sure I was going to find that. There are days after my surgery where I didn't care if I lived or died, and it's really hard to say that, but honestly, I mean, the pain was an 11 out of 10, and um, I wasn't sure I had the fortitude to get through this. Um, it was scary, and I'd never been tested that way to that extent. Uh, I've never felt that kind of pain and despair. I've always been a really happy person. I have a zest for life and wanted to live it fully, and I didn't, I didn't even care if I lived. And I thought, who is this person? Who am I after this diagnosis? So I just kept telling myself, this too shall pass. Um, you know, tomorrow is another day, as Scarlett O'Hara would say. Um, but it was so difficult. And I, I felt like after my LAR, I really hit rock bottom. It was time to dig out. So I dug deep and decided to get my life back. So fast forward again, um, uh, I'm a year past surgery, which is a huge milestone, and, and passing my two-year cancerversary was a huge milestone as well. When I was first diagnosed, I didn't think I'd make it two years, so um, you know, I was really, really happy and pleased to figure, to find that I was cancer-free. So my last scan did say I was NAD, which is a huge thing as well for stage four, and I was the luckiest of the unlucky. Um, you know, I had resectable disease and treatable disease. You know, most people at my age that are that latest stage, um, you know, it's much more difficult to fight because they have numerous tumors, and I was really lucky that I had three, and they were all uh, able to be surgically removed. Um, but I've been asked, you know, how's, how's the new normal after cancer? And I'd, I'd say that's a really tough question. Is there anything normal about a life touched by cancer? <laughs> Um, you know, I have scars, I have nausea, fatigue, I have hot flashes, and I have limitations I've never had before. And I also have a fear, the fear of dying young. Um, that will always plague my subconscious mind. I, I know, you know, it's, I can stay away from about 90% of the time, about 10% sneaks in, um, but I'm alive, and I'm so happy to be alive. I'm so grateful to my medical team and the advancements that have been made. Uh, by people like Dr. Liu and everyone else in this community that keep us all alive and keep us, um, you know, here with our families. Uh, yeah, I, I've been in NED for a year now since that last surgery, and I hope to uh, stay that way. I refuse to let cancer haunt me and steal my joy and my daily happiness. You know, I've learned a very important lesson through all of this, and it's to live in the moment. I, I enjoy every moment I've been granted. Uh, I just went with my children to Disneyland yesterday. It was the best experience. Um, and it's even sweeter when you know that your life can be taken at any moment. Um, you know, everything can change on a dime with this disease, but, you know, I'm still very, very hopeful and positive, and everyone out there should be that has this disease. Um, someone uh, uh, that I respect greatly shared um, four shaman laws with me, and they've been a great comfort to me, so I wanted to share them with you. They are, it starts when it starts, it ends when it ends, the right people show up, and what happened is the only thing that could have happened. And those words have brought me so much peace through all of this. Um, dealing with metastatic cancer is not easy, and uh, you know the fear of recurrence is always there, but I will never let it control me. I just won't. There's always hope, and there's always something celebrating every day. Uh, despite cancer, um, beautiful things have transpired in my life because of this terrible experience. I found so much happiness and healing through all the advocacy I've been able to do through the petition, through change.org, um, making our voices heard, working with wonderful groups like CCA, um, you know, and the Never Too Young Coalition. Uh, it really gives me a purpose and a meaning again. And um, I've also learned to be my own best advocate when it comes to medical care. And will continue to share my story and educate others as much as I can. Anyone that will listen, I, I will tell a story um, because people need to know that we're not too young. Um, we need to share our stories, all of us that have been affected by this, and educate the public about symptoms, guidelines, and the fact that no one's ever too young for this disease, the colorectal cancer. I really appreciate all of you letting me share my story, and uh, I hope it will inspire all of you to share yours as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Don. Really, thank you to Dr. Liu, to Travis, to Dave, to Allison, and to Don. 
uh, this webinar has been uh, most informative, but also inspiring. Um, at this time, we will ask our presenters to respond to a few questions posed by our attendees during the webinar. Uh, I'll introduce Kevin Bergerson, uh, my colleague at the Colon Cancer Alliance, who will pose the questions. Unmuted. Thank you, Lauren. Um, we, our first question um, does come from Robert. Robert uh, has asked, he, he was diagnosed at age 47, stage 3. Um, his father desired, uh, died from the disease that same year. So he has a family history. He wants to know what are the recommendations for testing of his children, and they currently show no syndromes. So that, it's a great question, and um, what I would say is that, you know, what the guidelines tell you is that at, if you're diagnosed at the age of 47, uh, if I remember that correctly, um, that your uh, first degree relatives then need a colonoscopy uh, at the age, well, 10 years prior to your original diagnosis. And, you know, the, that idea kind of comes from the thought that colorectal cancer typically takes about 10 years to develop. Uh, from a polyp to a full-blown cancer, of course, I think a number of doctors will tell you that we've seen plenty of instances where we believe it's developed much quicker than that. Um, but for uh, any kids, uh, that means that uh, they would start getting screened at, at 37. And honestly, it's kind of our standard of practice here at the University of Colorado uh, to basically send everybody to our hereditary cancers clinic who's diagnosed with a cancer before the age of 50. Uh, mainly because it is so uh, unique, and, and it might not ever lead to any genetic testing, but uh, certainly a discussion that, that you can't, uh, it can't hurt to, to have uh, to at least uh, to talk about it. And then, of course, for any siblings, uh, the recommendation is to go ahead and get tested now. All righty. Thank you. Uh, next question comes from Kara. And Kara asks, does surgery versus radiation decrease your chances of recurrence? Right. Uh, and so that's, a, that's another great question, and it's one that's a little bit unique to where they find the cancer, actually. Um, obviously, the mainstay for any uh, kind of early stage colorectal cancer is to cut it out, to get it out. Um, for rectal cancers, not colon cancers, but cancers that, are, that, that develop in the rectum, um, there is evidence that a combination of low-dose chemotherapy and radiation before surgery, and what they call, they call that, the technical term for that is neoadjuvant, but essentially any treatment that's given before the surgery would be considered neoadjuvant therapy. And so chemotherapy and radiation combined for rectal cancer uh, has been proven to decrease local recurrence of that cancer. And that's why for a lot of rectal cancers, instead of actually proceeding directly to surgery, even though it's still a curable cancer and we can cut it out, we actually typically often, you know, offer a combination of chemotherapy and radiation therapy to treat for about five or six weeks before surgery. We let you rec uh, recover from that, and then about four weeks later, we take our patients to surgery and may offer some chemotherapy afterwards. So in certain situations, radiation can certainly decrease recurrence, but for kind of traditional colon cancers, we typically do not offer radiation in that situation. That was a good question. Uh, next one comes from Peter. Uh, Peter would like to know, are there any clinical trials designed specifically for young patients? <laughs> and that's a great question, and I hope I come back to you next year and tell you that the answer is yes. As of right now, um, there are no clinical trials that are specifically directed towards young patients with colorectal cancer, at least um, the kind of trials that I'm talking about are more treatment-related trials. Um, I think that there are some quality-of-life trials that are ongoing across the country, um, which are obviously extremely important. Uh, in terms of active therapeutics, um, we don't have enough information. In other words, the science hasn't directed us yet uh, in this area. Uh, one of the research interests uh, here at our institution, um, but I'm also collaborating. I mean, again, there's so many uh, researchers that are uh, um, aware now 
uh, of this issue. And so certainly collaborating with researchers at UCLA and MD Anderson and others uh, to actually collect uh, tumor samples from our young patients with colorectal cancer. And we're actually trying to find out if there are actually uh, mutational differences between young patients and older patients. And so I'm hopeful um, that uh, that research will lead to some promising targets. Um, but again, I think it's still extremely early. Um, but uh, I hope the answer will be yes in the future. Our next question comes from Thomas. And Thomas would like to know, is uh, Don, are you taking any uh, chemo maintenance treatment at this time? Uh, I'm not. Um, there are various studies and different oncologists I know, and Dr. Lee could probably answer this a little bit too, but, um, you know, that believe maintenance chemo helps or doesn't help. Um, you know, and in my case, because I don't have any recurrent disease right now, um, you know, some there are some trials out there like ADAPT, um, that are for people that are NED that want to continue in chemotherapy, um, but maybe they had disease elsewhere and it's, you know, it was, it was pushed back by all the chemo and they want to stay that way. For me, because all of mine was resectable, um, kind of the, the group consensus was that I don't take anything. So I actually finished my last round as a LODA about eight months ago, almost nine months ago. Um, and I haven't been in, on anything since then. So I've just been, um, you know, using supplements and, and other things to try to strengthen my immune system. But no, I'm not on anything uh, right now. Thanks, Don. The next question uh, comes from Robert, who wants to know that with genetic testing, are there any centers on the East Coast where one can go? Um, so, uh Another uh, great question. Um, so on the East Coast, uh, if you go to any comprehensive cancer center, um, or uh, they will most likely offer um, a genetic counselor and genetic testing. Um, a lot of the testing is uh, a send out anyway. Um, but what you really want is um, uh, a team that's dedicated towards uh, having these conversations to, know, uh, to make a decision uh, between the team and you uh, if, if genetic testing makes sense uh, and it's something that you're interested in. Um, and so, uh, and what I mean by comprehensive cancer center is really any NCI designated comprehensive cancer center will have it. Um, and they're literally all up and down the East Coast in, in, in any major city. Um, and so, uh, so it, it's fairly easy to find. Okay. And, and we also actually have this on our website of uh, expert care facilities that we're with uh, like, with gastroenterologists and a team of doctors that, and it's growing, uh, of uh, doctors who specialize in hereditary forms of colon cancer. It's uh, on our website, hcctakescots.org. Excellent. Next question comes from Sanal. Sanal, uh, Sanal says, uh, her, my mom, recently passed away with colon cancer that met, uh, metastatized to her omentum. The pathology showed that it was signet ring cell cancer. She was 60. My sisters and I will begin getting colonoscopies at 37. But I was told that signet ring cell is very aggressive and sometimes is missed due to the way it is seen through PET and CAT scan, CT scans. Besides colonoscopies, is there anything else we need to do to prevent that type of cancer? Okay, uh, so that's a very complex question. Um, so the signet ring uh, cell is essentially uh, a description of what the cancer looks like under a microscope. And when we see these, and I wish I could show you a picture, but when you kind of see these uh, like band of dark rings within the cells, it's suggestive of a slightly or sometimes a very aggressive uh, cancer. The reason to get colonoscopies is actually um, to find a cancer before it even develops into a cancer. Uh, and so um, even though the signet ring kind of histology, and what I mean by that is the signet ring appearance under a microscope, is suggestive of an aggressive cancer. The theory is that 
uh, or at least the hypothesis is that that cancer still developed uh, from a polyp and that polyp uh, when uh, not found and not resected continues to grow, develop more mutations and eventually turn into a full-blown cancer. So actually getting a colonoscopy now is a great thing, uh, especially in terms of being able to find these cancers before they develop into cancers. And so by getting colonoscopies and removing polyps, uh, you can actually prevent this cancer from ever forming. Now, is colonoscopy a perfect test? It isn't. Um, and then you kind of go into, well, is there any additional testing that we can do to maybe find a cancer at an earlier stage? Uh, colonoscopy is still the gold standard, the best test that we have. What we haven't been able to prove is that, can, you know, if we get serial MRIs or CT scans or PET scans, uh, can that potentially save a life? And we haven't ever found that uh, to be true. Nothing has uh, been necessarily better than colonoscopy. And uh, when you kind of subject yourself to unnecessary CT scans and PET scans, you may end up getting radiation that your body then receives from that scan uh, that can also lead to development of other cancers. And so a lot of times when you look at tests, you're just looking to the risks uh, or the benefits outweighing the risks. And, and so what I would say is that definitely get the colonoscopies with a CT, the PET scan, and the MRI. The benefits probably do not outweigh the risks of the test, and I wouldn't recommend it. All righty. Got a couple more questions here. Steve ha has asked that um, my husband was diagnosed with colorectal cancer at 48, stage 3C, with 32 out of 53 nodes testing positive. Is the likelihood of cancer spreading more with the increased number of nodes testing positive? Um, so that's a, uh, another great question. One of the things that you want to make sure of whenever you get a surgery to take out your colorectal cancer is to make sure that more than 12 lymph nodes have been removed. And obviously in this case, it was way more than 12. Uh, the more lymph nodes that are taken out, uh, the higher quality of the surgery. Uh, interestingly, uh, it's easier to take out more lymph nodes in younger patients than it is in older patients. Uh, and this fits that description. We're able to take out over more than 50 uh, in a young patient that had developed colorectal cancer. The simple answer is the more nodes that are involved, the more we are worried about the cancer coming back. Um, but in a way, it doesn't necessarily change what we would recommend. And so after finding that many lymph nodes positive, you would want to give six months of chemotherapy to try and kill whatever cancer may have been left behind. And so uh, what I would say is that it definitely is concerning to me. I have a similar patient, actually a 27-year-old gentleman who had a similar uh, number of lymph nodes positive, um, also received adjuvant chemotherapy and is doing, for, is doing quite well, uh, con continues, to be no, uh, continues to have no evidence of disease. Um, so it is concerning, um, but it sounds like he got the treatment that he needed to get, uh, and, and that's where the evidence is uh, to give the chemotherapy to prevent the cancer from coming back. Excellent, Dr. Lou. Appreciate that. Great. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much to all of our panelists for uh, participating today. As mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, the Never Too Young Coalition and the Colon Cancer Alliance truly want to hear from you on how to make delivery of our webinars better. Uh, look for the survey feedback email tomorrow. Uh, we promise that it's an easy five-minute survey, and feel free to provide uh, any feedback that you have, uh, any feedback that you res that you send to us only helps us to make uh, future webinars better. As mentioned at the beginning of this webinar, this is the first of a four-part series of My Story, Colon Cancer Before 50. The next webinar will be later on this fall, talking to uh, more patients about uh, their experiences during that initial diagnosis with colon cancer. Thank you for attending, and we sincerely hope you enjoyed this webinar. As a reminder, the webinar has been recorded and will be available for viewing within a week of the broadcast at ccalliance.org slash webinars. If you'd like to share your comments regarding the webinar, please forward your comments to young at ccalliance.org. 
On behalf of the Never Too Young Coalition and the Colon Cancer Alliance, I'd like to once again thank everyone for attending this webinar. I hope you found it informative and value added. Good afternoon and take care.